Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of AI Insights, which is a series created by the European Center of Excellence in Exascale Computing, research on AI and simulation-based engineering at Exascale, or in short, Siri Race. In AI Insights, we aim at shedding some light on the research that is performed by the different partners of the project. And uh, my name is Andreas Lintermann. I'm from the Jülich Supercomputing Center at Forschungszentrum Jülich. I'm the coordinator of this project and I'm your host for today. Today, uh, I'm very happy to have my first guest here, uh, who is Fabian Hübenthal from RWTH Aachen University. Fabian is working on Word Package 3, which deals with uh, compute driven use cases at Excel scale. And he himself is a PhD student at the Institute of Aerodynamics and Chair of Fluid Mechanics and is working in a project on active drag reduction techniques for turbulent boundary layer flows uh, with the help of AI techniques. Welcome, Fabian. Wow, well, well, thank you for, uh, and thank you for having me. So, yeah, maybe we start a little bit by uh, introducing yourself uh, so that everybody gets to know you and maybe you also want to talk a little bit about how you found your way to RWTH. So that's a good question. Yes, as you told us already, so I'm a PhD student at the AIA, so at the RWTH in Aachen uh, since last year. So it's today uh, almost exactly one year since I started there in my PhD. And yeah, um, so that's what I'm doing at the moment. So as you told, uh, I'm working in the project Siri Race. So especially in the task 3.1, working on AI techniques for turbulent boundary layer flows. And especially if concerning the uh, application, it's about active drag reduction. So as the word or the phrase suggested, um, it's how can we actively reduce, for example, the drag, which is encountered when having an airfoil. So moving through air, like flying from Europe to America and so on. And yes, that's my research topic. Okay, cool. And Sounds good. How did you get get there to to uh, adaptation? I mean, certainly you also studied yeah. there maybe and dived your way into uh, uh, through the different courses and then got somehow interested in fluid mechanics and then ended up at Wolfgang Schröder Institute somehow. Or how did it work? Yes. So I think it's not a straight path. So starting, for example, I, I, I'm going to start with the childhood dream I had. So actually, I wanted to become an inventor when I was a child. So something like Thomas Edison, which uh, who invented the light bulb. And yes, so it's a kind of naive dream as a child. So, but I think it's not that far away today. But for example, when I got um, to school, so as a young student at school or in school, um, I found, for example, the passion in math and mathematics and physics and chemistry and so on. And so it evolved over, over time. And for example, as Christmas and birthday presents, I got something like a chemistry tool, a toolkit, a fuel cell, and for example, solar panel. And for example, from that, I... I had some ideas like building a small road worthy bar car and so on, which I can use. So, so that's, I think, the starting point of getting interested in, for example, mechanical engineering. And over time, for can, example, can, as a, can I ask a question? So, uh, at school, uh, did you have a specialization in math and physics? Yeah. So in Germany, uh, that's the Abitur. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe people are interested if they want to follow the same track as you. Uh, maybe they can already start in school specializing on something like that. So as you heard already, so yeah, math and physics. So that where my main courses I visited. So I attended to. And yes, so that's kind of my special specialization in, at school. So. Okay. And yeah. And honestly, when, for example, choosing my study, so mechanical engineering, obviously here in Aachen, um, I was not quite sure if it's the right study. So deciding between math and physics and maybe something which is more oriented towards applications and but which is mechanical engineering, obviously. And yes, I somehow picked it. So choose. Uh, chose um, mechanical engineering because it's in between, so between application and the theory. So you can use both sides, and it's kind of the yeah middle path. And 
after time, I think um, after two years, one to two years, I was quite sure that I wanted to continue that kind of study. And um, luckily, for example, when I had this course, which is called, or lecture, which is called uh, Fluid Dynamics 1, so I got the first time in, co in contact with fluid dynamics. And so it was kind of a very fascinating field of research. And that's what it was the reason why, for example, after lecture, I just uh, talked to Professor Schroeder, which is that's a, that's uh, now a mandatory, that's a mandatory yes. course, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a mandatory uh, course. And so it doesn't, didn't feel like a mandatory course because it was so interesting and especially seeing how you can solve very complicated problems and how you can understand your environment and how you can use these principles to solve uh, daily life problems, for example. And after, I think it's the third or fourth lecture, I just contacted him, uh, him so my professor Schroeder, and um, I just asked him, yeah, is it possible to work at your institute? Uh, is there any position free for me and any opportunity to work in this kind of very interesting field and yeah, it took just I think one month and then I started there as a student assistant and that, that was the first time I got in contact with that kind of institute so okay yeah so and, and then you continued with your that was a bachelor first right and then you continue with the masters yeah okay so and that, it was that means during during the time, I mean, th this is always a good thing. I, I, I noticed myself because I was also mm -hmm. a student assistant. Um, and uh, it's, uh, let's say, a, a good thing uh, when you can do some work uh, um, aside from your studies um, and uh, learn something, something differently. Yeah. So I, I also really enjoyed that. But then you continue with your methods and then? Um, yes. So um, it was not the straight path. So I wanted to somehow look beyond just fluid mechanics. So I wanted to learn more about, for example, uh, data-driven approaches, machine learning, and so on. So that's the reason why, for example, um, for the internship, I was at uh, Bosch, uh, the battery systems, um, GmbH, um, where I applied some data-driven approaches. And afterwards, I was uh, uh, changing towards um, uh, the cybernetics lab here in Aachen again. So, being back in Aachen, I changed to the cybernetics lab. Um, Bosch is in Stuttgart, and, right? Yes, Bosch is in Stuttgart, yes. Um, and that was the time where I wanted to explore more the, the side of data-driven approaches. So it's the reason why I changed, for example, my position there. And for example, in... Uh, okay, maybe that's a good point to start. For example, the bachelor thesis, which was quite a time when I was very interested in the machine learning um, side and um, there was another topic which I found was quite interesting and I wanted to start to learn more about which is optimization. So optimization is somehow very closely related to machine learning so it's oftentimes behind the scenes what is happening so when for example learning from data and so on and yes that's the reason why for example I chose the bachelor thesis to make it at the um, AVT, SVT, so that's the Institute for Process Technologies uh, in Aachen. And um, yes, I learned a lot, I have to say. And afterwards, for example, when being um, at the cybernetics lab, I looked around and wanted to learn more about, for example, control theory, how to apply these optimization principles and so on. And that's the reason why, for example, I started a master thesis at the Control Institute here in Aachen. In that. And so, and I deepen my understanding about how optimization works and how to apply it, and so on. Yeah. But but things like machine learning uh, or in general AI technologies, that's not part of the studies, right? So you had to uh, dive into that yourself. Yes. So back then there was not actually a lecture which is called machine learning for mechanical engineers and so on. Or so on. It was more like you do have some optimization classes and some statistics classes you can choose from but uh, at that time so i think five years ago it started to pop up that for example nowadays there is actually a class which is called machine learning so but it, it's kind of fused from the statistics side and the optimization side and and so on yes okay that means also in the studies more and more this machine learning and ai technologies they are becoming more and more 
uh, relevant also for the yeah. applications and for the research. Yeah, I understand. I mean, um, especially for example, the cybernetics lab is, it was giving the, um, informatics one and two classes. And also then they evolved into the direction of machine learning. And yes. So oh, okay. nowadays it's really a part of, um, when you study mechanical engineering here, uh, at the RWTH. Uh, yes. Okay. That's very good. And that's some, something that is then, uh, um, lectured by computer scientists or, uh, are these, um, people from uh, the Faculty of Engineering? So both. So they are from the Faculty of Enge uh, Mechanical Engineering, and they are, for example, at the Cybernetics Lab, um, almost always data scientists. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so it seems you already, during your studies, uh, you gained some experience with machine learning, applied machine learning uh, to different uh, to different applications. Maybe we can now talk a little bit about uh, the topic that you're working on in the project. So it's mm -hmm. about uh, turbulent boundary layers and active drag reduction. This sounds maybe a little bit complicated. Maybe you want to explain a little bit what are, what are boundary, boundary layers and uh, or turbulent boundary layers and what are active drag reduction techniques? So turbulent boundary layers, so that's a very good here. Yeah, when, when did, do I start? So turbulence, I mean, um, you encounter every day, so every day. So it's something like a turbulent motion of the fluid. So fluid is something like gas and air, or ga gas, water, and so on, um, which is around you. And turbulence is closely related to chaotic systems and chaotic uh, movements and so on. So chaotic or chaos in general. So it's maybe very difficult to understand how it evolves from one certain time step to, an, to the next time step. So that's the reason why it's challenging. So it's chaotic. And um, yes, that's, I think, the simplest way to understand what turbulence mean, means. And so the the second part, so boundary layer flow. So whenever you have something like a wall, something like, for example, an airfoil, and you do have a free stream, stream which is coming towards your wall. So close to the wall, there's a different flow regime, so different behavior of the fluid flow. And yes, this kind of small region around the, the wall itself, it's um, called the boundary layer, so which mm. is kind of differently uh, to when compared for for example with the free stream velocity, there are some different physics pr uh, prison principle valid with that. Okay. So, for example, the viscous forces are more dominant in this kind of part. So that's the reason why, for example, we want to focus on these boundary layer flows because we want to reduce this drag, which is related to this viscous property of fluids, and we want to reduce this drag actively. That's the reason why it's called active drag reduction. Well, why do you want to reduce the drag? That's what is it for? Have you an example? Okay. Yes, for example, just having a look at a small animation we had, or we have made in the past. And um, we can see, for example, here a small airfoil. And I am going to start the animation itself. And you can see, for example, the airfoil and the lower part, which is here highlighted in gray, there's a region which is somehow activated. So when using this kind of activation, we can, for example, influence the boundary layer flows. And that's the flow which is very close to the wall, as I explained earlier. And when, for example, reducing the drag, the airfoil itself uh, experiences something, so less drag. And of course, if you have less drag, you do not have to spend that much energy to move through the, the air to fly, for example, from Europe to America, for example. And then you can save, for example, not only costs, but for example, C2 emissions and so on. And that's the driving force behind this kind of active drag reduction technique. And as we can see, for example, here in the animation, the activation starts and it's propagating in the spanwise direction of the airfoil. And in the lower plot, you can see um, the drag reduction in comparison to the non-actuated case. And we can see that it's almost so 10% of drag reduction, which we can achieve with that kind of technique. Oh, wow. Yeah. But uh, um, is this already in place? Is this already installed in aircraft? Mm, so what I'm doing here is um, 
almost yeah, it's basic research. But um, when, for example, comparing active versus passive techniques, active techniques are not that widely spread at the moment in the industry. That's the reason why we do have to um, make more basic research and we have to gain more knowledge by using, for example, AI technologies. But on the other hand, the passive techniques like, for example, sharkskin inspired surfaces, they are actually explored by, for example, the Lufthansa. I think that's the Arrow Shark um, project which are trying to get it more to the real world application. So the passive techniques, they have kind of a lead at the moment. So they're ahead of the active techniques because active means you have to actively reduce the drag. So you have to put some energy into it versus the passive techniques, which are, you just have to, for example, modify the surface by using these skin charts. So that's somehow okay. the reason why the more research is needed for the active domain. Okay, I understand. I mean, for the active uh, uh, methods, you really have to also invest energy, yeah, to create the movement, for example, that you've just shown. Okay, I understand. Yeah. So um, now I was wondering. Uh, I mean, this this uh, this thing that you've just shown, yeah, this, this is this a simulation, or is this yes. coming from an experiment? No, it's actually a simulation. So it's. Um... So the term describing it, it's called CFD, so computational fluid dynamics. So which is simply a technique technique to solve the physics equations behind it, which describe this kind of flow around the airfoil. Mm -hmm. And when solving these equations, we get out these flow fields, and we can, for example, um, make some colorful pictures, which is um, <laughs> usually the phrase for telling someone I'm doing CFD because we do create some colorful pictures, but actually these colorful pictures help to understand what is going on in the flow field itself. And as I visualized there, you can see this kind of boundary layer flow, which is turbulent, which is kind of highlighted by these, I call it eddies. So small eddies and big eddies and so on, which you can see by these colors and so on. Okay, so uh, I imagine because I see many details in the simulation, this uh, I, I can, could imagine this is uh, expensive to compute, right? Yes. So that's the reason why, for example, tell the layers or boundary layer flows are very interesting because when you want to resolve these flows, you want to resolve it means to get the information which is needed to describe it close to the wall because there are so so many different scales. So small scales, small eddies, and large scales, these large eddies and so on. And the outer flow is different, for example, um, when compared to the inner flow, which is close to the wall. And when resolving all these details, um, these simulations are getting very expensive. So and that is something, for example, we can work on when using machine learning tools and so on. Ah, we want okay. to learn from past simulations, how to, for example, speed up the simulation process. And for example, in my case, so um, by just having given you an overview of what we are doing here in the research, so there are three main fields of research. So the first point is we want to optimize the active, uh, active drug reduction techniques. So there are some parameters like how fast is the surface moving towards the spanwise direction and so on, and with uh, which amplitude and so on. So there are some parameters we want to optimize. And the second part is we want to understand how actually this active drag reduction technique is working. So why is there any drag reduction and so on? And when understanding it by using machine learning tools, we can, for example, come up with a new idea how to activate it and how we can, for example, improve this kind of acti activation technique. And the third part is we want to speed up the simulation process, as we have um, discussed before. Um, it's expensive, and maybe we can learn from the past how to speed up it. And this is somehow involving uh, involve, um, involving learning. So, yes. So these are the three main parts uh, we are working on in this project. Okay, that means, but I mean, but the, the machine learning methods, the AI methods, they, they need some input for training, right? What, does this mm -hmm. come then from these simulations that you do? Yes, so this is the basis, so this is the databases, but at the same time, when, for example, using a kind of, it's called Bayesian perspective, we not only use the data, but we also use the experiments we have so far from the humans, which are set, which set up the, uh, who set up the uh, simulation and what is the knowledge they have already gained in the past. So we do not want to ignore this kind of knowledge because 
Um, yes, you can apply, for example, a generic neural network to it, but then it's maybe too expensive to mm -hmm. tune it, to train it on the data. And so that's the reason why we do need both the data and the knowledge of the persons, um, which kind of uh, um, construct the architecture of the neural network, for example. Okay. So from my understanding is when I look at the picture uh, of the animation that uh, most of the important things that are happening in, in the region of the boundary layer. So there must be uh, some kind of high resolution in the simulation. And, uh, but this is very expensive, I understood, if you really want to solve for all the phenomena that uh, are happening there. So um, I know that there are uh, methods around that uh, filter uh, the, the, whole, um, the whole domain yeah, and make everything a little bit cheaper. And then uh, something needs to be uh, applied in the vicinity of the boundary layer, wall, wall models, something like that I, I have heard of. Uh, can you maybe say something like that? I, I know that you're developing something like that in in uh, in this project, which is AI related. Yes, so um, that's a good question. So especially the term modeling. So when, for example, there, there's the naive approach of so it's quote unquote naive when, for example, directly solving the equations. So directly solving the equation is very expensive because then it has to be really really well resolved and when using modeling approaches, that doesn't all have, uh, always have to be a machine learning uh, model, but it can be any model. Um, can I, can, can yes. I briefly interrupt? So when you say expensive, what does it mean? I, uh, I, know, yeah. I know that you run these on high-performance computers, but mm -hmm. how can people imagine how this works? Yes, um, sometimes it's quite challenging to get a feeling for these numbers, but uh, for example, the costs, which is um, measured, for example, in how many cores you use and for which time you use these cores. For example, it's in the order of millions of uh, core hours. So that means when just having one core, it would take one million hours, which is a pretty long time. So just to have a feeling of the uh, magnitude of order, which we are talking about here at the moment. And, and that kind of order is expensive. So from the, so as the definition at the moment. Okay. So that means you really want to use uh, many cores to get to the solution as uh, fast as possible. And therefore you use high performance computing systems. Okay. That's the reason. Yes. So when, for example, increasing the number of cores, so we are talking about CPU cores, which are inside of the computer. So, yeah. and um, when using many of these cores, we can uh, accelerate this, that kind of simulation. Yes. Okay. Okay. Let's get back to the other topic. Sorry that I interrupted you. No so, problem. Uh, so uh, wall models. Wall models. Yes. Uh, we're talking about this modeling. So we do not want to directly solve the equations. So, because as we have discussed it's expensive, so we are seeking for a modeling approach which kind of replaces the expensive part of the simulation, which is very close to the wall because we have to resolve the flow phenomena there. And when using modeling approaches, uh, you basically do have two options. You can use something which is theory based, so or so which is based on the experience uh, the experts have or you can use for example the data you already um, gathered in the past and try to come up with a better model to for example use a course of simulation and to kind of super resolve the flow at close to the wall and to speed up the simulation process because you do not have to run the fine simulation but you can use the course of simulation to super resolve it to the final resolution and to get the almost the same information out of it. And so at the moment, we want to, for example, try to use some machine learning based um, algorithms, which are exactly doing that. So using the past data and yes, have to find a model which is quite good. So, and we can compare it, for example, to model um, one modeling approaches, which are already present in the uh, literature landscape. Okay, that means in an ideal case, you have this finished model that really can predict the um, turbulent boundary or the, or the flow close to the wall. And you would run your normal simulation with a less, a smaller resolution, which is then cheaper. And then you evaluate the model in every time step of your simulation, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So, uh, is there, uh, um, so you, you were talking about three different uh, aspects. Yeah. So this was one uh, aspect, wall modeling. Yeah. So then, mm -hmm. and then you were talking about, 
uh, drag prediction and uh, um, let's say the energy or the, uh, the the net of the power that you uh, uh, that you, uh, that is required in the end, yeah, uh, to realize yes. the active drag reduction thing. So there you also so use AI techniques, right? Yes, um, that's closely related to the optimization uh, part of the project. And so the first question is, what do you want to optimize? So actually, it's not only the drag reduction itself, but it's we are more interested in the net power savings. So because you do have to spend some energy to get this kind of active um, one uh, active one motion uh, running, and uh, we're not saving that so more energy than you spend for activation it's not worth to explore and it's not applicable in the real world so that's the reason why we focus want to focus in the next step on the net power savings uh, because it's the most valuable thing for the application itself and at the same time there are some constraints so just reducing the drag so the trivial solution is just do not fly so we are not interested in these these trivial solutions and of course um, that's the reason why we want to somehow activate the wall without negatively affecting for example the lift so the airplane should be possible so it should be able to fly so that's the reason why we have to consider all, uh, always these kind of constraints to avoid these trivial trivial uh, solutions yes and that's that are the objectives we want to achieve so the drag reduction and the next step the net power savings which we are, we are mostly interested in Okay, and maybe maybe to go a little bit into the details, how does it then how does it look like? I know that uh, uh, machine learning models they're different layers and they're connected. And for this specific thing, how does it how does it work? So um, at the current status of uh, the project, uh, we try to use some it's called reduced order modeling, and um, we want to find a kind of surrogate model for these objectives. So you do have some inputs like the equation parameters like the amplitude and the wave length and so on and on the other side you do have the drag reduction value itself and the net power settings and there has to be a connection between these and in between they could use a kind of machine learning model to map the inputs to the outputs and without for example running very uh, many of these very expensive simulations so you use some simulations simulation data from the past to train this model, and then you can evaluate uh, much quicker. So that's the reason why, for example, um, machine, machine learning, all these neural network techniques, so uh, are, are often called um, the expansive part is moved to the training, but the inference at inference time, so when evaluating or using the, that model, is pretty, pretty cheap. So that's the advantage of using these machine learning tools in comparison to the simulation itself. When evaluating these simulations, they are pretty expensive when doing the simulations. So that's why it's always called you're moving the kind of expensive path to the training. And uh, in this particular case, uh, we use some um, so simpler models. These are not neural network approaches. So this is something like which is based on uh, support vector regression, for example, or Gaussian process regression. So it's what is, related what, what to is, these. What is support vector regression? So it's an approach to, for example, when having some data points. So just here one, here, here's one, and here on. Um, so find so one, something... one data point is uh, something like a configuration. Yeah. So you have a specific yes. configuration, and for that, Let's say a amp certain amplitude, uh, frequency of the, of the wave that you introduce. And, um, then you obtain, uh, like, uh, something like a net power saving or, and a drag or something like that. That's the data point, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So every single simulation is one data point in that kind of space, which is, uh, spanned by, um, these equation parameters. And you want to find something which is, kind of connecting, not exactly connecting, that's more like overfitting to the data. So having every single information to yeah, represent it perfectly. So it's not what we want exactly, but uh, we want to find a good approximation of the relationship between the inputs and outputs by fitting a kind of, in that case, when we focus on the 2D uh, plane, just a kind of line to find these relationships. Okay, so so something like a um, like a function that approximates uh, these points without really going through all the points, and the overfitting yeah. is then really trying to uh, fit all the points, right? 
Yes. Okay. Because um, in ca our case, it's not that um, yeah, severe because, um, but when having, for example, very noisy data, that could be lead some to some problems when overfitting to the data. Yes. Okay. So, and uh, how do how do you evaluate the, the how good the uh, the machine learning model works? So, um, oftentimes there's a trade-off between a measure for the data fit. So, how close are we to these data points, and how close are we to the, for example, you, you divide the data, for example, in uh, training data and test data. You can evaluate it on the test data and see if it's close enough to it by using some creditative techniques. And um, yes, that's um, how it's usually done. So splitting up the data and training and test data, and then, then you can evaluate it. And as I told, so there's a trade-off between the data fit itself and the, on the other side, the complexity of the model. So the driving force or the uh, paradigm we use is we want to use a proper model. So it has to be appropriate, which means do not use the most complex model, but the model which fits the data and is also easy to understand and easy to uh, interpret. Okay, I understand. Yeah. And that's that's the trade-off between over and under fitting uh, we are talking about at the moment. So it's, which is uh, present in every single fleet and machine. <laughs> okay, so um, you're, it's not RWTH uh, alone that is working on this topic, right? In the project. Yes. Uh, there are also people, also other people contributing to that. How do you work together with those and ho who are these people? So, um, for example, my um, task, which is 3.1, which is dealing with the turbine boundary layer and when using AI, um, they actually, um, many people involved. So, for example, it's me from the AIA and, of course, from the uh, research center in Jülich. Um, they do have, for example, a huge supercomputing center and so on. And there's a team um, uh, which I'm working with. So, they are specialized in the um, domain of uh, neural networks and so on. And we do have regular meetings, for example, and we discuss approaches and we have to evaluate, uh, for example, which is work to be explored and so on and work to be, um, for example, tested and, and so on. And uh, that's why um, at the beginning I uh, yeah, uh, explained that you do have to use the knowledge of the humans and you have to combine domain knowledge. For example, in my okay, in my case, it's the CFD side. So I'm re representing the CFD domain or the physics domain. And on the other side, for example, in Yulish, they are representing the kind of machine learning focused side. So, and by combining the knowledge of these experts, um, it's much better and it's easier to, for example, come up with an idea which works because um, there are so many possibilities. You have to boil it down and you have to find a starting point, a good starting point, which is not complex to uh, show how all the pr basic principle works and what is the most promising uh, approach to follow in the, uh, yeah, in the next um, steps of the projects and so on. So that's the reason why I cannot highlight it enough. So uh, cooperation and um, communication and talking about these concepts, uh, concepts and discussions are very, very important when, for example, working in this kind of projects. Okay, that means you really need experts from different domains, like yes. uh, mechanical engineers with expertise in computation fluid dynamics, uh, AI experts, uh, HPC experts uh, doing training on these machines at large scale and also doing the simulations, etc. Okay, I understand. And and as a side effect, um, there's always something you can learn about. So, because you're not the expert for everything, but you're the expert when doing, for example, your PhD, you're an expert for your PhD topic, but you yeah. have to look somewhere else to get some new ideas, to find, to use new approaches and yes, to gain more knowledge and so on. So every single day you can learn something new. That's the positive side of that. Yeah, that's very good. That's very good. I mean, this is something the researcher uh, is uh, keen off, yeah, to really new, uh, learn new things every day. Yeah. Okay. Um, this, this sounds very interesting. Do you see uh, uh, an application of this, except maybe for uh, aerospace uh, um, in the future in other fields? Yes. Um, 
So we have to be honest, um, when using these active drag reduction techniques, um, there's a kind of overhead you have to put in. So a technological overhead means you have to transport the system, which is actually activating uh, the surface. And um, personally, I think, for example, high-speed trains, they can yeah, uh, have an advantage in using these techniques. They do not have to fly, so to transport these heavy systems, you have to also put energy into it. And maybe that's an interesting field of application. And um, high-speed trains, yeah, that's something I can think of, which can okay. benefit from that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely to make sense. Uh, certainly, everything that moves fast uh, in uh, uh, through air, yes. for example. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, transportation is uh, very important in our society. So to transport goods, people, and so on. And I do not think that we are going to stop the transportation. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Okay, so um, yeah, I I think uh, you uh, you did uh, an excellent work uh, on this, and you explained it very well, uh, in my opinion. I mean, you also want to communicate to, to this to other uh, um, experts and other researchers. Uh, so is is, yeah. is it anything planned uh, where you want to distribute that? Let's say peop uh, people in research they they write papers and uh, uh, they go to conferences. Do you have a plan for that? Um, yes, for example, um, there's coming up a conference in Dresden, which is in Germany, end of May, and there, for example, I'm going to present some results from the optimization part um, of that project. And uh, for example, in um, is at the beginning of September, there's a, another conference which is called ETC18. So it's about the European. So it's called the European uh, Turbulence Conference in Valencia. And um, yes, it's yeah. So these are the conferences uh, which are planned at the moment. And for that, for example, as you have told, um, you have to prepare some results and you have to write some papers. And when, for example, so at first you have to formulate an abstract. So what you want to, uh, for example, present and what is the main essence of your work and so on. And when accepted, then you will be invited to this kind of a conference. And afterwards, uh, usually you, pre you uh, publish your paper. And uh, that's something we use in research to communicate ideas, to boil down the ideas, to make it uh, as understandable as possible for others. And to communicate these ideas to be tried out, for example, in different fields of research. And the side effect of that is um, it's a kind of new communication channel you use. <clears throat> you get, for example, feedback when writing these papers, not only um, inside of the institute, but from outsiders as well, and so on. And for example, um, when uh, thinking about, for example, some colleagues at the institute, um, one of my colleagues, um, colleagues, uh, she has finished her PhD last year, and she actually, actually told me that one of the papers was very important because of the feedback she uh, got. So there was one feedback which actually guided her PhD to the end. And oh, wow. Okay. That's, uh, that's very good. So, yeah. So, so it's really like reviewers' feedback and uh, also talking a lot uh, to people at the conferences, networking, getting to know what others do, uh, etc. Yeah. So distributing the work that you do yourself and learn about new opportunities that others develop, right? Yes. And besides from these conferences, there are, for example, also uh, some um, internal meetings, for example, in race. So uh, in January, for example, we met in uh, Geneva. Um, at the CERN, um, so it's the famously known um, research center for uh, nuclear uh, research and so on, and that's a different um, communication channel, for example. So we are living in times where, for example, uh, through the coronavirus and so on, um, these online meetings are very, very popular and uh, yeah, and uh, that was the opportunity to, for example, get in contact with the persons which are involved in the project, but really personally and so on. Yeah. I mean, personally, it's always better than uh, um, like virtual meetings. Yeah. that's, that's I mean, both sides, they have uh, some advantages, but uh, I think it's the mixture between online meetings and um, I call them offline meetings. So it's, yeah, not, yeah. I think it's not the actual word, but 
the online meeting reduces the CO2 put, uh, footprint. So it's, uh, we could yeah. say it's also some kind of, in a wider sense, active drag reduction technique. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. And that's a good anal analogy because um, having the, that kind of flexibility, that's something, for example, which is uh, an advantage of these active drag reduction as, as, uh, techniques as well because we can adapt to different um, environmental influences and so on. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, a good true. Analogy. that's true. Yeah. Okay, um, I think we slowly have to come to an end. I, I mean, I could talk to, uh, forever with uh, with you to you because it's a very interesting topic that you're working on, and it's so diverse and has so many aspects, and also has seems to have really a good impact on many disciplines uh, and so forth. But uh, I think we slowly need to come to an end. Uh, um, but maybe I, I don't know when you. It seems like a lot of work. So how how do you usually relax from this kind of work? I know PhD studies can sometimes be. Uh, a little bit exhausting. You have deadlines, etc. But and then there's a time again when you can relax again. How do you do that? Um, yes. How do I do it? So, uh, for example, I love doing sports. And uh, in the past, um, so it's a very long time ago. I think since I was 14, 15, I was playing indoor volleyball first, and afterwards uh, I got in touch uh, with beach volleyball when starting studying uh, mechanical engineering. And for example, we had some um, pretty nice uh, vacations when doing, for example, a beach volleyball camp. And um, for example, we have been in Valencia for one of these camps. So particularly it was uh, Gandia and for example, Gary and so on. So there are some beach camps we visited. And so that's something I really enjoy. So playing beach volleyball with my friends and so on. And the uh, second part I'm very interested in is uh, something like doing uh, tours, like bike touring and hiking and kayak touring and so on. And uh, I can simply show you some pictures, for example. Um, and there's a funny story. Um, I think it was 2015 or 2016. Um, there was the idea to, for example, attend a kind of beach water camp in Valencia. Uh, um, and um, I talked to a friend of mine and um, we had this kind of crazy idea. Uh, instead of flying to Gandia, we can, for example, just take the bike and avoid, for example, <laughs> flying. So that's the kind of active drag reduction technique as well. And um, actually, we did it. So we it took just, um, I think it was five weeks to get there, but uh, we enjoyed, for example, the, the whole path like in science you have to enjoy the path to the goal you want to achieve and yes so the funny story is um we tried it so going down to the south of germany through switzerland uh, france and then actually <clears throat> to barcelona meeting a friend of mine because barcelona is very interesting and then we stayed there for some days and then we traveled uh, further down to valencia then to Gandia, and so on and um on the path to this kind of beach water camp, uh, a girlfriend of mine, um, uh, she phone called me and asked me, so which uh, airplane do you want to take and so on? And she didn't realize that we really wanted to get there by bike. And uh, I explained her, uh, we are already, already on track. So, and she was kind of confused because she doesn't want to know, uh, to realize it. So, and then it was, quite funny too so that's a funny story behind that kind of stuff and uh, recently for example last year i started to enjoy kayak touring so for example in uh, sweden we have been in sweden uh, with these kind of it's called sharon islands so very many of these small islands you can sleep on and so on it's uh, very beautiful and besides that um, of course hiking so we can see here a picture it's from bulgaria actually and um I love to do sports in general, like calisthenics, for example, and uh, I can simply show it to you. Um, so uh, this is kind of um, the logo of our sports team. We found it uh, at the end of last year. And yes, so we are officially now an um, association for calisthenics, for example, in Aachen. And We'd like to, for example, organize some competitions and trainings and so on and sessions so you can meet up with the athletes, for example. So that's how I enjoy, for example, my um, leisure time. So doing sports or some 
for example, in the last week, some carpentry work, for example. So there are many opportunities. So you just have to look around and find something you're interested in, and then it's easy to relax. Yeah. Fabian, I have to say that's a perfect ending yeah, of the interview. Uh, uh, ending with uh, some advertisement uh, for your team. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, like I said, we could, I think we could go on forever and maybe we will have a, another episode, uh, on, on the work, um, that you're doing in, in this project or some, some things that you do in your spare time. I think we should meet anyway and talk about that because I have sample interest in my spare time. So, um, yeah, with this, uh, Fabian, I really would like to thank you, uh, for your particip participation, um, in this interview and, uh, everyone else who's interested. Um, this is uh, now published on YouTube and the next uh, um, episode will appear in roughly one month. So thanks everyone for listening and uh, hit the subscribe button and thumbs up for us yeah, for the Siri Race project. Thank you. Bye bye. Yes, yeah, thank you for having me and these very interesting questions. So thank you. Ta -ta. Bye bye.